to John chapter 5 with me this morning, please. And verse number 28. The Gospel according, according to John the Apostle. John the Apostle, chapter number 5, and verse number 28. The divine text says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice yeah. and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Father, bless this holy book now and your word as it goes forth. Father, for the purpose that you intend it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. The Apostle John in John chapter number 5 says that there's going to be two resurrections. There's going to be a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. As a matter of fact, when you study the Bible, you find out there are seven resurrections in the Scripture. Seven of them. A lot of folks have the idea there's simply one general resurrection. And I'm in sure no doubt a lot of good people believe that. They love the Lord, and I'm not here this morning at all to question their motives. But I do believe the Bible teaches that there's more than one resurrection. There's a re resurrection of the just, as we just read here, and a resurrection of the unjust. I want you to notice some of them with me this morning, please. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 28, the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead. And when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, the Bible said he became the first fruits of them that slept. He was the first man ever to die and rise again, never to die again. Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ therefore became unique in that because once he arose from the dead, according to John chapter number 11, he personally became the resurrection and the life. The resurrection now is no longer an event. The resurrection is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now many people have been raised from the dead throughout the Bible. You can quote illustration after illustration. But every last one of them that was raised from the dead died again. And so therefore they simply had their body raised up but the spirit and the soul had not been completely resurrected in the new spirit of Christ Jesus our Lord. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the first resurrection. The Old Testament saints in Matthew chapter number 27 verses 51 through 54 came up from the dead after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible said he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So the Old Testament saint arose from the dead after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter number 2 there is a resurrection that is called the new birth. Every one of us in this house today and throughout this world if we have been born again, have literally been raised from the dead spiritually. Hallelujah to God. Raised from the dead. That is a spiritual resurrection. And that has already taken place. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verses 13 through 18, the Apostle Paul had a mystery revealed to him. And that mystery is the rapture of the church of God. When he comes for his saints and he calls their names and they go up to meet him in the clouds. That is a resurrection. They are called up to meet Christ in the air as he comes with his saints from glory. Then in the book of Revelation chapter number 6 verses 9 through 11 there is a resurrection that takes place at the end of the millennium. At the end of a thousand years on this earth a resurrection takes place and a resurrection takes place at the end of the tribulation period. These resurrections have to do with tribulation saints and with those my friend who belong to the family of God. This is another resurrection that we find in the Bible. Then in the book of Revelation chapter number 11 and verse number 3, you have two witnesses that are resurrected midway through the tribulation period, Moses and Elijah. And this prefigures the mid-tribulation rapture of the church of the living God when they're caught up to meet him in the clouds. It is not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is gone when the Lord comes. He catches up to meet him in the clouds. We're looking for his appearing at any moment. And my friend, that rapture is finished. But tribulation saints made up of Gentiles and Jews 
in the middle of the tribulation period, we have every reason to believe that there will be another rapture that takes place to catch them up to meet him in the clouds. The wording in Revelation chapter number 11 says, come up hither. And that is exactly what he'll say to the church of God. So a tribulation rapture and then the unsaved dead in Revelation chapter number 20 verses, verse 6 and then 11 through 15. And this, my friend, sad to say, is the resurrection of the unjust. And this is when the dead will come forth from the graves. And it's really not called a resurrection in the sense of the resurrection of the saints where life comes back and they come up from the dead. For the unsaved are literally cast out of their grave to be brought before the great white throne judgment bar of God. What a sad, sad day that'll be to be brought before God and to be judged for their sins and the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to be there. You do not want to be part of the resurrection at the great white throne. That, my friend, finishes all the resurrections in the Bible. As you can see, there are many resurrections, but the one that counts is the one that three days after they nailed him on a tree, laid his body in a virgin tomb. My friend, death could not hold him. He came forth from the dead. I want you to understand that that was a new day. I want you to understand that a new light was shining. I want you to understand that a new power was released upon this world. I want you to understand that hope began to flood the souls of men because the power of death had been broken. Death has bars, death has gates, death has power. But all of it was put against Christ had to be broken and it was at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to God. A Christian has every reason to shout and rejoice today because the Son of God arose from the dead and the angels sing he lives and the cherubim sing he lives and the seraphim sing he lives and so I do today. I say to you he lives, he lives, he lives and because the Lord Jesus Christ lives this gospel message that we preach is a powerful, powerful message. I'm not preaching to you to go find a tomb. I'm not telling you today to go find a monument. I'm not telling you to go today to go find some teaching somewhere that's ancient and revered. I'm telling you today to go to Jerusalem. I'm telling you to go outside Jerusalem. There's a garden tomb. I want you to walk by it and look inside and I'll guarantee you it'll be empty. It's empty because he spent three days and was raised from the dead. As a matter of fact, the garden tomb has a cistern underneath it. It's got a huge area to collect water and it was used 2,000 years ago as a garden. You can stand at the garden tomb and you can look off to your right on top of a hill and it looks just like Golgotha. As a matter of fact, Charles Allenby, a British a general back in the late 1800s was walking across the top of the walls of Jerusalem and he looked across the street over there and he said, my goodness, he said, this rock formation looks just like a skull. So he went over there and he began to investigate and he found out that not only did the rock formation look like a skull, but there was a tradition that people had been crucified right there on the road in front of that skull. He examined a little further and he found there was a garden. He he found a garden tomb. He found an empty tomb. He found this huge cistern underneath and he began to connect the two together and he said to himself, this must be where my Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on top of that hill. They took his body from there and they laid it in a tomb. And then three days later they came and my friend, when they came that Sunday morning, they came to a stone that had been rolled away and that stone was rolled away, not for him to get out, but for them to look in. Amen. And there, when they looked inside that empty tomb, they saw the angel sitting where the body of the Lord Jesus Christ had lain. And the, and the light began to shine out of that tomb 2,000 years ago. And it still shines to this day. If you walked in this house this morning and had no hope, you came in here today with no peace. You came in here today not knowing where you came from or where you're going. You came in here today with no understanding of why you're in this world. I want you to understand one thing, that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary yeah. and there he shed his precious blood yeah. so that you could be saved. And then on the third day, folks, on the third day, on the third day, to prove he was who he said he was, he arose from the dead. Yeah. 
The Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians deals with that. He talks about how important the resurrection of Christ is. And let me say, folks, it is the absolute most singular important thing in all of the Bible. For if Christ is not risen from the dead, all we have is a bunch of religious platitudes. We're just another religion. We're just something else that men have thought up. But if he did rise from the dead, everything has changed. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, he lays out some simple arguments. In verse number 14 of 1 Corinthians 15, he said, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. What does vain mean, preacher? It means it's empty. It means that it's an illusion of your mind. It means it is something you've concocted on your own, that you've made up your own religion, but it has no power. It has no ability to change the individual. There's nothing to it because it's you are the source of it and it can't go any further than that. The apostle said, if Christ is not risen, my, 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 he gives you the hypothetical question. What if he's didn't? What if he didn't rise from the dead? What if his body lay in the tomb? But you can be sure of this, 2,000 years ago when those Jews, oh, many of them, many of them unbelieving Jews, if they could have found the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, they would have lifted it up on a cart, they would have paraded his body through the streets of Jerusalem, his body would have forever been an emblem, a signature of the fact that he was an imposter and a liar because he was still dead. But they couldn't find his body. And the reason they couldn't find his body is because his body was not dead. His body was alive. And 40 days after his resurrection, 40 days in the Bible, the number 40 is the number of trial and testing. 40 days after his resurrection, on the Mount of Olives, while the apostles stood gazing upon him, he had given them his last word in the flesh. The Bible said he had began to ascend from the face of this earth. He rose up from planet earth. He was rising up into the presence of God. This sinless, perfect man that had my friend never sinned one time in his life had established a righteousness that did not exist before he came on this world. God now was manifest in the flesh and the God man had established the righteousness of the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now the earth could hold him no longer. He had been perfected and he began to ascend. It could not hold him. He, my friend, was not of this world. He was from above and he went back where he came from. But I like what those angels said. On that day when they looked into heaven, they said, this same Jesus that you've seen gone away, this same Jesus, get the word and get it right, this same Jesus that you're watching go off into heaven shall so come again in like manner as you have seen him go. What does that mean, preacher? That means that he's going to come back physically, visibly back to this earth just exactly as he left it. The liberal progressive teacher gets up and says, well, Christ has come back in spirit. His teachings are with us today. He has motivated us to a better life. He has set the example. He has showed us the way. And so therefore he has come back. No friend, he's coming back personally and he's coming back personally because the next time he comes, when he comes and puts his feet on this earth, the next time it'll be as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so he rose and then he ascended. So the apostle says in 1 Corinthians 15 that our preaching is vain and our faith is vain. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 15 he said, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified that God raised up Christ whom he raised not up. We are false witnesses of Almighty God if the Lord Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. In other words, we are religious liars. I don't know of a term that's more denigrating than that than to call someone a religious liar. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, is the witness of the truth of God. In verse number 17, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. And note carefully what he said. Ye are yet in your sins. This is not about a bunch of stuff that we believe in our head. 
Christianity is not about assimilation of a bunch of facts. It's not about some religion that teaches you how to live. Christianity is a person that literally comes inside your soul. And when he comes inside your soul, your sins leave. Because when he comes inside you, he cleanses you from your sins. You feel a cleansing that you've never had before. You're not turning over a new leaf. You're not reforming the old man. You're not becoming a new person in the sense that people understand you to be different. No. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes into the heart of a man, he cleanses that man of his sin. By cleansing him of his sin, he cleanses him of his guilt of his sin. He cleanses him of the condemnation of his sin. You say, preacher, how in the world could such a thing happen? Let me tell you this. The Bible says to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. How do you, how do you persuade someone who has lived a filthy, godless, profligate life? They've lived like dogs upon this earth. They are the scum of the scum. They're the bottom of the barrel. They're the worst of the worst. And my friend, when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, all of that hell leaves them. And a face of joy, a gleam and a glow comes upon their soul. They've got somebody in them that is undeniable that a change has taken place. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? And it's not just a temporary thing. It's not just, uh, just here now, but it's permanent. It's forever. Uh, Fifty years later, they're still washed in the blood. They're still different. And that joy and the power of God that comes into the soul of the individual. You can't explain it. Amen. And you can't explain it away Amen. except by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ who, <coughs> who arose from the dead, sits at the right hand of the Father and comes by the Spirit of God into every single one of us who are believers today. That's one to me, folks, to me, because I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. I did not physically see his resurrection. I haven't seen angels. I haven't been through all of that, but I know what happened to me when I believed. My sins were gone. I can't explain to you unless you experience it yourself how that all of that burden, that weight, that condemnation, all of that, it's gone. In a moment, it's gone. Hallelujah to God. So the apostle Paul said, you're yet in your sins. But then in verse number 18, if Christ be not risen, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Let me tell you what you may not already know. And some of you have lived in a la la land up until a certain point in your life. You've never lost anything. Everything about life that other people endure is hypothetical to you because you don't know what it is in reality. But the day is going to come when you're going to carry the body of a mother. Most dear, precious mother, the one that loved you and brought you into this world, the day will come when you'll carry her body to the graveyard. Or oh, that dear, precious father that was there for you and raised you and taught you what you needed to know and was faithful to you as a dad, that you had great love and respect for, you'll watch him die and you'll carry his body to the graveyard. Or maybe it's a precious little child, a little girl or a little boy. That's the delight of your life. And for some horrible reason, they're taken away from you and you carry that little lifeless body to the graveyard or a husband or a wife that you've been married to 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Part of you, dearest to your heart and to your soul and watch her or him die and carry that body to the graveyard. The apostle Paul said, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then they're dead and perished and are no more. What a horrible thought. If I thought that were true, that they're dead and you'll never see them again, then you have no reason to tell me at all how I should live. Where do you come off giving me your morality and your standards and your judgments and your rights and your wrongs? If there is no absolute God and absolute eternity, then there are no absolutes. It is dog eat dog. It is whatever I have to do to survive 
And if I have to take you out to survive, I take you out to survive. If I have to remove you from the face of the earth, and friend, there are people by the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions who believe exactly that they are, my friend, what we would call materialistic atheists. They have no hope. They have no future. It's all about survival, and they will do whatever they have to do to survive. Make no mistake about it. But if you're born again, I can go to the graveyard of my grandfather and my grandmother and my mom and my dad, go to the graveyard of family members, go to the graveyard, my friend, I've been here a long time of all the caskets we've carried out, all the way from little caskets no bigger than this, to the caskets of young married people, to the caskets of older people. I've been out there, I know where they are, I've been to graveyards and places that people don't even know exist. I can go to these graves and I can stand and I can see their faces and hear their voices and remember what they were like in this world. Let me tell you something, I'll see them again. I'll see them again. That cannot be taken from you. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. But the apostle Paul said, if Christ be not risen, but since he is risen, since the Lord Jesus Christ is alive today, then that means everything to us as Christians. I don't know of another faith on the face of this earth that would dare get up and tell you that their founder died and rose again. Name one. Name one. Name one. The signature of the church of God is an empty tomb. <laughs> an empty tomb. That's what it's about, an empty tomb. And he said, because I live, ye shall live also. Do you believe Christ arose from the dead? Do you believe he's alive today? Oh, I believe it. I know it with all my heart and all my soul. Notice what the apostle Paul says in verse number 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. He said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He now has risen. I like this disjunctive conjunction. I think that's what they call it. But now, but God, but now, but God. Oh, it's going bad. It's getting worse. It's going down. What can I do? Woe is me, but God. Oh, I've tried everything I can try. I've failed every way in the world you can fail. There's no hope for me. There's nothing left for me, but God. In plain words, you've come to the end of your road and there's nowhere else to go. You've exhausted your resources. There's nothing else can be said but God. Your extremity is his opportunity. When your door shut, he is the door. When there is no way, he makes a way. When the light doesn't shine, he becomes the light. God is everything and without him, there's nothing. The apostle Paul says, but now, <laughs> but now is he risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He puts some theology in there when he says first fruits. It's really eschatology is what it is. What's that mean, preacher? It means that Christ is the first one of the whole line that follow after him. He's not the first one to rise from the dead, but he's the first one to rise from the dead never to die again. But it goes further than that. Because he lives and he is the captain of our salvation. He is, the Greek word is archegos. He's the leader. He's the pioneer. It's like when Lewis and Clark went out west and they went into virgin forest for Thomas Jefferson and they were checking out all this land. They were mapping rivers and mountains. They were going into places that no man had ever been before except the uh, Native American, the Indians. So they were going, they were pioneers. They were unfolding a new world. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, is going into a new world. He is the world. He's leaving this world of corruption, death, and hell behind, and he goes into a new world. And wherever he goes, I go, because I'm in him. And so when he's the first fruits of them that slept, the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 spells it out. Christ is the first fruits, and then they that are Christ at his coming. That's us. Hallelujah. I'm not going to a place. You're going to a place. I'm going to a person. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
I'm going to the one who in the book of Genesis says, let there, be careful now, be. The Hebrew word translated be is bara. The Hebrew verb bara means to bring into existence what did not exist and to do it by using nothing. In plainer words, his spoken word created. I'm going into the Lord Jesus Christ <laughs> who goes into the future and all he has to do is say, let there, all right, kids, children, watch, let there be. Say, preacher, what's the be going to be? <laughs> I don't know. But man, I'm going to be there. I want to see it. <laughs> I've always been a curious chap. I want to see what the bee's going to be. He's got something in store for us. You say, I thought preacher is all about heaven, streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl. That's the bride, folks. That's the bride. That's just the beginning. Of the increase of his kingdom, there is no end. Let there be. And then he unfolds for you, the creator, all this creation, this new existence, this new universe. And the Bible says the heavens shall melt with fervent heat. Amen. It's all going to go and burn up. So I hope you don't have everything piled up here because everything you got piled up here is going to go up in smoke. You better be up there where he says, be. And then when he says, be, watch it explode before your very eyes. How many of you in this house this morning believe that God can create like that? I certainly do. And I'm going to watch it. I'm going to see it. And then I'm going to see him as he is. He's alive. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I could preach you another message on who wants to keep him in the grave, but that's a different message altogether. But you could just imagine, can't you? Father, in thy name we pray. So you use what little bit I've said this morning for the glory of God. Help folks, Lord, speak to their heart. Comfort those who need comforting today. Father, I pray for healing. I pray for deliverance for those, Lord, who specially need healing and deliverance. All that's in the atonement, my Father. For the Lord Jesus went to the tree. He paid for everything, everything, everything. In thy holy name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen.